Good morning, everyone. As always, wonderful to spend Sunday morning with you. I don't know how you feel, but if you've been paying attention to what's been going on in the world around us over the last few weeks, you'll probably agree with me that we live in a world that is in conflict. See, all around us, there are events that are happening, there are debates on the go, there's people responding to things that are happening. And very often, that can be divisive. Probably two of the most divisive topics at the moment is elections and then COVID and the response to COVID. Because it seems wherever you go, people will have differing opinions to yours. And that's okay, but how do we respond to that? You see, we live in an inescapable reality. We live in a world that is full of a war of worlds, worldviews, and different ways of thinking. And depending on your personality, you might respond in different ways to people who think differently to you. Some people tend to want to shut off people that think differently to them. If we don't agree, then I don't want to spend time together. And so I want to cut people off. I want to unfriend or unfollow. I want to remove myself from people who see the world differently to how I do. Other people respond differently to that. They feel like it's their job to re-educate and to bring people over to their side. And so whenever an opportunity arises, they launch a full-on verbal assault to let people know what their opinions are and to bring people onto their side. And probably you respond in one of these two ways or a myriad of other ways. And I wonder what your experience has been if you've been responded to by somebody who disagrees with you. <clears throat> and if you disagree with someone else, what impact has that had on your relationship? Since we're living in a, in a time where there's a lot that's out there to divide, how do we move towards a united church as Jesus envisioned in John 17? You see, Paul, even in the book of Ephesians, talks about unity within the church. And so we have this current reality in which there's much that's out there to divide the world, but we also know we're moving towards a united church. And so how do we hold these two things in balance, in tension? Well, I want to say that Jesus tells us in, in Scripture to love our neighbors. <clears throat> and we've spent some time talking about that in the past, about how to love our neighbors. But he also tells us to love our enemies. It's found in Matthew 5 from verse 43. It's part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And during that teaching, he says, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his, his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are well, not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. So Jesus speaks about loving your neighbor, and then here he speaks about loving your enemies. Now, I want to say from the beginning that probably someone you disagree with is not your enemy. We don't really live, most of us at least at the moment, within a context of a physical war where we have an enemy, which is another person. But when we talk about enemies here, we're talking about those that are, that are more difficult to love, those that we don't love so naturally. See, the idea was that the neighbor is somebody who is a little bit more like me and it's easier to love. The enemy is someone that is difficult to love. And Jesus is saying, well, what credit is it to you if you only love those that are easy to love? But we need to love others, those that are different, those that might think differently to us, who respond differently to us, those <laughs> that have differing opinions. And so we're called, if we consider loving our neighbors and loving our enemies, actually just to love everyone. Jesus asks us to love everyone, even those that are perhaps causing pain or hurt to us. And what you've probably noticed if you've been in many debates or many discussions, or if you've lived a long time with someone, is that it's not really easy to change someone else. Perhaps you've tried and you've hit your head against that wall many times. It's almost impossible to change somebody else. The only real power and the only person that we have to change is ourselves. And again, if you've tried to do that, you'll know that that's not so easy either, because it's something we have to do in partnership with God. 
See, God is forming Christ in us as we walk with him. The spirit in us is making us look more like Christ. And so we cooperate with him and see change happen in our lives. And so if I'm to love my enemies, it's probably got a lot more to do with my response than what it has to do with theirs. So how do we practically go about loving our enemies? Because it's great to say, go and love your enemies. What does it look like? Well, I want to take two ideas that come out of Ephesians 4 and apply these as principles to help us love our enemies better. And again, when I say enemies, I just mean people who are more difficult for us or not as natural for us to love. So how can we love people better? So there's two principles I want to talk about. The first one is around communication. It's a practical way in which we can love better. And the other one is around prayer. I'm going to start with communication first and say there's four principles of communication that come out of Ephesians 4 that we can apply. And if we apply them, as it's indicated here in the scripture, it's going to help us love better and it's going to move us towards unity. What a beautiful testimony that would be within a world that is so divided and becoming more divided to see people coming together, even if they don't see the world through the same lens. You see, there's a difference between unity and uniformity. We've spoken about this before. Jesus talks about a church that will be united, but not uniform. Uniform means that we would all look the same, think the same, act the same. But Jesus didn't create us in that way. He created us diverse and different, with different angles and views, but being able to come together. That's unity. So let's look at. Ephesians 4, and see these different principles of how we can communicate well. See, the first step in being able to communicate well, to be able to love my neighbor well, is to communicate truthfully. Ephesians 4.25 says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully. So this applies at all times. This is not just for people that you disagree with. We should be truthful at all times, obviously. But specifically now, when we're in a conversation with somebody that's more difficult to love or somebody that sees the world differently to us, it's important that we are truthful. It doesn't help to lie or exaggerate or to rationalize. Because if you start a conversation with a lie, you'll end with a lie. It's important that we're honest and truthful with each other. Now, I want to say that also means that we use some discretion and wisdom. See, it doesn't help to walk up to someone and say, wow, you're looking fat today, or what happened to your hair? I mean, that's not the model we see Jesus doing or using. But what we do see Jesus doing is being completely unapologetic about the truth. See, Jesus always told the truth, and he stuck up for the truth. And that's important that we can stand on those principles. We don't have to be ashamed about the truth. We don't have to be apologetic about the truth. That's a reality. This is how things are, and we can believe that. And that's completely fine. But this leads into the second point, because it's very important that we stick to the truth, but also that we stick to the truth in love. Because the second principle is that we need to communicate tenderly. Ephesians 4.15 says, instead, speaking the truth in love. See, notice the word love. That's the key here, is we need to be unapologetic about the truth. But we also need to share the truth in love. I love this phrase I heard somebody share. He said, truth without love is brutality, but love without truth is hypocrisy. You see, we cannot have love without truth, and we cannot have truth without love. The two need to go hand in hand. And of course, we know this because this is who Jesus is. Jesus is both love and truth. We cannot separate out his character. We cannot break Jesus in half. And so in the same way, when we communicate, we need to communicate in that truth, truth and love together. Proverbs 15 verse 1 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath but harsh words stir up anger. Have you ever been in an argument and noticed that as one person starts raising their voice and getting louder, the next person begins to do the same? Every now and then I'll get a a text from my grandmother. Now, back in South Africa, she has her phone, but she's never figured out how to take caps lock off of her phone. And so whenever she sends a text message, it's all in caps. 
And so as soon as you receive the message, it feels like she's busy shouting at you through the phone. And immediately you want to get defensive. Now, I don't actually think my grandmother could shout at anyone, so I get over it quite quickly. But what happens when somebody starts becoming aggressive, when somebody starts speaking harshly or starts raising their voice? Very quickly, we get on the defensive, we, we straighten up, we respond in the same way. And the Bible tells us that we need to respond in the opposite way, respond in the opposite spirit. See, it's the gentle answer that turns away wrath. And sometimes I've gotten this right in my life and sometimes I've gotten it very wrong. But I've noticed that when somebody starts raising their voice, when there's a huge difference of opinion, it's when we can keep things calm. If I don't raise my voice, if I don't engage in the same way, we're very often able to calm things down and be able to speak properly. You see, there's so much emotion attached to differing opinions. And if we actually want to get to the truth, if we want to be able to talk easily, if we want to be able to actually discuss the issue at hand, then it doesn't help for both sides to begin to raise voices or to be on the attack. And so there's a lot of wisdom here in scripture. It's difficult to sustain a one-man fight. When someone's wanting to fight and fight and you don't engage the fight, very quickly it begins to die down. And so we need to communicate truthfully and we need to communicate tenderly. The next thing we need to do is communicate timely, in a timely manner. Ephesians 4, 26 and 7 says, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Now, I want to say this scripture is not talking about literally at sundown. You must make sure that all your issues are resolved. But it is talking about making sure that it's done in a timely fashion. See, if it was just talking about a literal sundown, then it means you are allowed to be angry for at least three months during the Norwegian summer in which the sun doesn't set. And that's not true. But what it's talking about is the fact that we don't allow anger to fester, that we don't allow it not to be dealt with. It needs to be dealt with and it needs to be dealt with quickly. When I have an issue with someone or when I'm upset with them, I don't want to let it linger for as long as possible. Sometimes we need to take a bit of time to work through issues. But what it's saying is don't bury it under the carpet. Don't hide it away. It's going to fester. It's going to make you bitter. It's going to come back to haunt you at a later stage. And so I need to communicate honestly. I need to communicate truthfully, <laughs> with love, tenderly. But in a timely manner, I need to communicate quite soon as well. See, when I'm trying to love someone practically, trying to love someone I disagree with, that we don't see the world in the same way, we're not always going to come to resolution. In other words, we're not always going to come to a point where we're in complete agreement. And so that's not the goal in loving someone. The goal is that we come towards reconciliation. That's important. See, we have an example of this in the Bible. Paul and Barnabas get into a, quite a big fight in the book of Acts. They go on a missionary journey and they take John Mark with them. John Mark, the one who would go on to write the book of Mark later on. And they arrive in a really difficult environment. Mark takes one look at where they are and he decides he's not cut out for this and he leaves. So Paul and Barnabas continue on their, on their mission. And at a later stage, they go, they return and they go out on another journey. And Barnabas says, let's bring Mark with us again. And Paul says, are you, you, know, are you crazy? This guy abandoned us last time. He's not trustworthy. And they weren't able to come to resolution. They weren't able to agree about what to do. But it was important that they move towards reconciliation, which at a later stage they did do. And so what I want to say is when we're moving or when we're in a difficult situation, that's what we're aiming for, reconciliation. We can agree to disagree. Sometimes that's what's necessary. Resolution is not the ultimate goal. Reconciliation is in the way we love people who think differently to us. The fourth principle that we want to apply is to communicate tactfully. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. In other words, it's asking the question, when I'm busy talking, is what I'm sharing right now actually helpful? Or am I just talking? Am I just expressing words? Is it actually helpful? 
See, I need to think about what I'm saying. This is essentially what Ephesians is saying to us. We have to communicate tactfully and say things that are going to build others up. But equally as important is that we need to be able to listen. We need to be able to pause, to stop, to not be thinking about what we're going to say next, but to actually genuinely listen to someone. Because that is a mark of love. See, if I take the time to hear you out, even if I don't agree with your position, even if I don't agree with what you're saying or what you believe, because I love you, because I value you, I take the time to wait and listen. So important and so difficult to do in a world that's so fast paced and pushing you towards taking on a particular viewpoint. And so can we be people who listen and in that way show love to even those we disagree with? So that's the communication side. That's the first principle of how we can love better. But now there's the second side as well. And so important that we understand this side. That is the, the prayer side. How do we pray? Ephesians 4 verse 31 to 32 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ. God forgave you. So at the beginning, I said, we want to be able to love our enemies or those that are harder for us to love better. And there's two things we can do. That's to communicate better. And we looked at the four principles in, in Ephesians 4. And the second thing is to pray. See, why pray? It's because prayer is the only way that I can rid myself of bitterness. It's the only way I can deal with offense. It's the only way that I can process forgiveness. Because inevitably, that's something that comes along. When I disagree with people, when somebody is an enemy, when somebody has hurt me or harmed me, one of those emotions is probably going to come along the line. And that needs to be dealt with. See, I can't let bitterness take root in my life. I can't walk around offended. Because it's like I'm walking around with a box over my head. It's limiting my view. It's changing the way I respond to people, particularly people that are, are different to me. And so that needs to be dealt with. And we've spoken at length before about forgiveness. It's something that we need to choose to do. And that happens through prayer. I need to choose to pray for that person. To ask God to forgive them and for me to forgive them for whatever pain or harm has come about. I need to bless them in prayer. And this is a really important part to stress. You see, when we, when we pray about somebody we disagree, sometimes we want to see God's judgment or God's wrath come down. We want to see him fix their thinking or change their mind. It's not often our instinct to bless our enemies. It's not often our instinct to bless people that have caused us pain or harm. But this is a principle in scripture is that as we pray, we need to bless them. And that might not be instinctual for us. But I promise you, when you begin to pray, your heart begins to change. Because when I pray blessing on somebody, I begin to change the way that I see them. Remember, at the end of the day, I can't change anyone else. But I can work with God to have my heart change and to allow me to become more like Christ, to see them. As, as if I'm seeing through his eyes. Perhaps you can pray for somebody who's different to, to um, receive wisdom from God, to be blessed with wisdom, to be blessed with a closeness to him. Perhaps you can pray for them for peace, for love, because as they experience those things, they draw closer to God. And so we're called to bless even our enemies in prayer. And I have found that this is the most effective way to change my heart towards somebody that has perhaps been divisive or somebody that has been difficult for me to love naturally. Because as I've prayed, as I've blessed, my heart has begun to change. It's become to soften. It's changed the way I see them. It's changed the way I'm able to relate to them. It allows us to see them with love. And so we're called to bless, bless, and bless. And we do that through prayer. 
not praying against them or what they believe or their principles, praying for them, bless them with wisdom, bless them with closeness to God, pray for love, for peace. And then my heart begins to change. And you know what happens is when my heart begins to change, I become filled with compassion and kindness. And that's what Ephesians 4 asks us to do, is to treat people with compassion and kindness. And here specifically, it's uh, in, well, in the context that we're talking, it's our enemies. And the way that I move my heart into that place is actively praying for other people. Not for me, for them, but seeing my heart change. And maybe as I've been speaking, and even just in the last few weeks, you've got a particular person in mind. Perhaps it's a whole group of people that have been difficult for you to love, that you've seen disagreement, that you've wanted to disassociate from. And as we've been speaking, you've got these people in mind, and Jesus is calling us to love them. And so this is what I want to challenge us to do this morning, is can we take time to pause and pray for somebody like that? Would you take time to pray for somebody that you have found difficult to love? And as you pray, would you pray blessing on them and see how your heart changes? See, Jesus has given us the word to make us like him. And so as we put this in practice, we begin to look more like Jesus. And so I'm going to pray for us. And then we're going to take some time just to be silent. And I want to ask you to put that in practice straight away. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till the next day. Pray now. And let's trust God to change our hearts so that we can love everyone. And let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. And even as we read it, we know that it's difficult. It's not easy to put into practice. I thank you for the way it challenges us to live differently. Father, we live in such a divisive world, but you've promised that the church will be united. She'll be presented to you one day as a pure, pure, pure and blameless bride, spotless. And so as you move your people towards unity, Lord, I pray that you would help us to love our neighbors and love our enemies, that we would be able to love all people, that we would be able to put your word in practice. And for all of us that are listening this morning, I pray that you would show us, remind us, is there someone, is there a group of people, is there even a worldview or an ideology, whatever it may be, that we can pray for? We want to bless all people to come to a knowledge of you. We want to bless all people that they would experience your love and relationship with you. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to change our hearts so that we would respond as you would respond. And so we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.